Hello, and welcome back to another day in the arena. It's me, it's CGB, and today in the arena, we are going to check out the tri-colored creatures from the upcoming set, Magic Core 2020, or Core Set 2020, or M20, however they want to phrase that and put that together. So, the cycle of tricolor cards is very interesting. There's a creature in each uh, enemy wedge shard. There's shards and there's wedges. I think wedges are like friendly colors like Esper and shards are posing colors like Mardu. But if I'm wrong about some something like that, comments will correct me. So. Uh, each of those received a creature with all kinds of crazy abilities on it. We're going to cover each of those. Then we're also going to talk about a bonus creature that showed up in Naya for whatever reason. So, uh, all that and more after these quick messages. Hey guys, let's take a quick break to talk about Flipside Gaming's core 2020 booster box giveaway. From now until July 15th, you can win an entire box of M20 for free if you follow these steps. Number one, find $10 or more worth of stuff at flipsidegaming.com that you like. Easy. They have singles, they have sealed product, and they have all the gaming supplies you need. So, number two. Use the promo code CGB before checkout. This saves you 10% and it supports the channel at the same time. Number three, complete your order. That's it. Even a mono red player can figure it out. <laughs> Please check out the links in the description to read the giveaways, rules, and conditions. And thank you for supporting the channel. May the best mage win. The first card we're going to cover today is Kalia, the Zenith Seeker. For a red, a white, and a black, this is a legendary creature. It is a human cleric, which I find very strange because when I look at the art and I look at the abilities coming up, I thought this would be some kind of crazy hybrid or changeling. Anyway, ah, Kalia, I think we'll go with that, has flying and vigilance. 3-3, three, three. when the Zenith Seeker enters the battlefield, Look at the top six cards of your library. You may reveal an angel card, a demon card, and or a dragon card from among them and put them into your hand. Put the rest on the bottom of your library and in any in a random order. Oh boy. So this is potentially a 3-3 three, three flying vigilant creature for three. You know, a Mantis Rider level, uh, although Mantis Rider had haste. Uh, so this one's missing haste, but instead of haste, we get a draw, a potential draw three. And not just a potential draw three, it's three powerful cards. Angels, demons, and dragons are known for their strength and their power. And if you hit those in standard, you are probably hitting very large, amazing flying creatures. I am really excited about this card. Now there is... There is a restriction to kind of how good this card can be, and it is how much angels, demons, and dragons matter. Now, you don't have, you could try to build with all three and hope to hit the trifecta, get the hat trick, so to speak, with Kalia, but you could also focus on one or the, or two of them, because if you get this for three mana, if a three mana, three, three flying vigilance also draws you two cards, that is an absurdly good card. So let's say that we just focused on angels and dragons. I would say that demons is one of the harder ones. You can, if you build a deck around angels and dragons as your top end, some amount of times this is just going to be draw two super powerful cards for three mana. Very good. Rock solid. If you want to go for the hat trick, uh, what are your best bets in standard right now? In demons, it's probably Doom Whisperer. It's likely your best demon. I wouldn't blame you for playing Rakdos, the showstopper, but he might also kill your Zenith Seeker, your angels, and your dragons. Uh, but how, how could you not try that at some point? I probably will. And there's a few other demons uh, that we're going to cover at some point here uh, reviewing these new cards from M20 that are pretty solid. Um, I don't know how great they'll be though. It's interesting. And you just don't get cheap ones. That's the other big drawback with this card. 
you're hitting expensive cards. You have to make sure you get there. The rest of your deck has to be removal spells, things that affect the board early so that you can cast those angels and those dragons and those demons that you stockpile. The most effective dragons we have right now, you're probably looking at Skargan Hellkite. Uh, I would say you're most certainly looking at Skargan Hellkite. You can consider Virix, but it's so hard to play Virix Bladewing when Rekindling Phoenix is around. Angels, you know you want that Lyra Dawn, bringer. You know you want that Lyra. You know you want that Shalai. I don't know why I talk this way when I talk Angels, but I, I would say Angels is probably one of the thick T-H-I-C-C, -C, um, groups of uh, uh, creatures that you could try to get. And there's probably plenty of decent angels to go for. So I'm excited to try out our Zenith Seeker friend. I'm especially excited to try to hit the hat trick as many times as possible. So expect a Mardu demon dragon angel deck at some point featuring this card, probably as many as I can get my hands on. And will it be competitive? Will it actually be a fighter. Uh, this is a three mana card with an ETB and good stats. It certainly can be. The real question is, are the cards it can draw, like angels, dragons, and demons, are we in a world where those are good? Now, Lyra Dawnbringer was, I believe, tied for the most played creature with Lanoir Elves at the Mythic, in at the Mythic Championship. So that tells me maybe, maybe there is a home for this card here in Standard. Let's move along. Kethis the Hidden Hand is a white, a black, and a green, AKA Abzan. Uh, legendary creature, elf advisor, three, four, four, three mana, decent bod. Legendary spells you cast cost one less to cast. Exile two legendary cards from your graveyard until end of turn. Each legendary card in your graveyard gains. You may play this card from your graveyard. So, this is an interesting one. There are cards that jump out to me immediately, like, ooh, I could build around that, and I know what I'd like to do with it. And then there are cards that I have to read it a few times and get an idea for exactly what you can do with this in gameplay. The music is a bit loud on my thing. I apologize if you haven't been able to hear me very well up to this point. I'll have to check that audio. But, uh, going back... This card is interesting in a few cards that you can play ahead of curve. We just mentioned Lyra Dawnbringer. If you play this card, Lyra can come down on turn four. That is a pretty big game. Uh, legendary Sorceries. Uh, this lets you play Urza's Ruinous Blast on turn four, exiling all non-legendary cards. That can be pretty exciting. Specifically here in the colors of Abzan, um, legendary cards are Planeswalkers. So all these Planeswalkers count. You can play Nyssa on turn four. This is like a ramp effect for Nyssa. You could go turn one Temple Garden, Llanowar Elves, turn two Overgrown Tomb, Kethis the Hidden Hand, turn three Nyssa, um, and have a three, four body to protect the Nyssa as well. It's not like a mana dork. You could have done that before with a Paradise Druid, but now you have a three, four body to protect the Nyssa. That is pretty big deal. Is it worth having this many colors in your deck? Probably. There's... When I look at this right away, I'm like, hey, we could just be commanding the Dreadhorde. Like, we could include this. We don't really want to exile legendary cards from our graveyard playing Command the Dreadhorde, but this is very much like if we don't have our command, if we're in a fail state and we need some value, it has this effect where we can exile a few of our cheaper legendaries and cast a Liliana from the graveyard, it's our, like our biggest, heaviest hitter. So... This card seems to have a lot of potential, and we should definitely try it in some decks. I think that the turn 4 Lyra or turn 3 Nyssa sound particularly appetizing and are things we should look at. But Liliana, Dreadhorde General coming down ahead of schedule, or Ugin, um, either of those make a big difference as well. So, Kethis the Hidden Hand. Big weakness to Teferi, Time Raveler, getting this thing bounced is just sad and then getting it Kai's Wrath the next turn is tragic. If Esper Control is still a big part of the meta, this may not hold up, but I think it's worth a good solid try. In any kind of a mid-range type mirror, having that 3-4 blocking for Nissa's or stabilizing the ground so that you can start Lyra bashing, it just sounds so good. So uh, I, I'm looking forward to trying this card out. 
I checked the audio. It's fine. This is fine. Here we go. Uh, Kaikar wins Fury. This is going to be our Jeskai representative. One blue, red, white. Legendary creature, bird, wizard, mythic, rare, 3-3, three, three, flying. Whenever you cast a non-creature spell, create a 1-1 one, one white spirit creature token with flying. Sacrifice a spirit to add red. All right. We've got here kind of a continuation of Murmuring Mystic, a continuation of Sahili. Is it better than those cards? It comes with a pretty, with a 3-3 flying body, pretty average for the cost, not terrible. The three toughness scares me, Lightning Strike concerns me, Deafening Clarion makes me sad. Whenever you cast a non-creature spell, so that includes Planeswalkers or artifacts, things of that nature, create a 1-1 one, one white spirit creature token with flying. So, make spirits. Spirits is sometimes a relevant type. We do have a Supreme Phantom Lord in the set. I think that was with the last core set that we received it. That gives all spirits plus one, plus one. So maybe that could matter in some way. Also, sacrifice a spirit, add red. So this part is pretty interesting because what you have here is a potential mana engine. Anytime that you have a card that can uh, create something when something else is played and then generate mana by sacrificing what it creates there is potential for abuse there is possibly an infinite mana engine if you can link up a way to play your spells for free and then keep using the spirits to generate red mana uh, omniscience lets you cast all cards for free for example um, perhaps there is a, a game plan that revolves around omniscience and this card and then just making endless mana and playing endless cantrips and bane firing the opponent i i hold on just a second <laughs> okay <clears throat> uh, come along with me magical christmas land galaxy brain insert charlie from always sunny meme so what if we cast a bunch of like just early mana stuff and dorks and then we cast flood of tears which returns all non-land permanents to their owner's hand if you return four or more non-land permanents you control this way you may put a permanent card from your hand onto the battlefield so we return everything from our side and the opponent's side to their hand and then we put omniscience into play for free with flood of tears then we use Omniscience to play Kaikar, the Wind's Fury. Then we play Over... Remember, for free, because now everything's free. Then we play Overflowing Insight or some other card draw card. Draw seven cards, make a spirit, and then we play a whole bunch of other cards that draw cards, and we make a whole bunch of spirits, all of them for free. We're just making a whole bunch of free mana. And then we just sacrifice all those and cast a massive expansion explosion and win the game we did it we are the freaking champions um i believe that the way so it says non-token permanent so we can't return treasures but we can use like mana rocks cards like um power stone shard might go in a deck of like this something like that to generate mana give us more permanence or just some value critters Fibble Fib the Lost for all I care. That can draw cards, but it can't generate uh, mana from the Kaikar. But uh, you see, we just got some combo potential. There's probably a better way to do it. There's probably other things you can be doing. But just to get those creative juices flowing and to have just a crazy, I don't know what I'm doing, content. We just, we, we watch time, ads. I don't know. <laughs> all right, let's move on to the next one. Omnath Locus of the Royal is our teamer representative for one green, blue, red, a legendary creature, elemental, mythic, rare, 3-3. Three, three. When Omnath Locus of the Royal enters the battlefield, it deals damage to any target equal to the number of elementals you control. Omnath is already ele elemental. At the bare minimum, you get to deal a damage. Whenever a land enters the battlefield under your control, put a plus one plus one counter on target elemental you control. If you control eight or more lands, draw a card. Eight lands is a freaking lot. So it's hard to get that bonus value. Omnath Locus of the Royal is certainly part of an elemental 
tribal synergy that they're trying to push, and there are some good elemental cards. While I'm trying to focus this video on these shard cards, I can't really do it without also bringing in some of the other cards from the set. So let's look at a few other cards from the set next to Omnath to get some ideas of how to go crazy nuts with this card. Risen Reef is probably the one of the better payoffs for elementals. It's got to be the best payoff for elementals I've seen so far. Risen Reef is a one green blue elemental uncommon 1-1. One, one. Whenever Risen Reef or another elemental enters the battlefield under your control, look at the top card of your library. If it's a land card, you may put it onto the battlefield tapped. If you don't put the card onto the battlefield, put it into your hand. So you don't have to reveal the card, you just look at the card. If it's a land, onto the battlefield, and if it's not a land, into the hand. But it doesn't say you draw the card, you put it into your hand. Important distinction, gets around Narset, part of Veils. Something to think about there. Uh, so Risen Reef at three mana for a 1-1, one, one, not that great. They didn't want to make Rogue Refiner again, a card that said draw a card on it and turned out to be too good. So you just get the little 1-1 one, one body. But the important thing is the curve. You play the Risen Reef, then you play the Omnath. Assuming that you only have these two cards, you do two damage to any target, hopefully killing something relevant. If Shock is a good card in the meta, two damage can matter. So that's fine. Uh, if you hit a land with your Risen Reef, you put a plus one plus one counter on target elemental you control. It can be the Risen Reef, it can be the Omnath, either way. Pretty sweet. Otherwise, you get a card in your hand. And if you control eight or more lands, draw a card. Risen Reef ramps you towards that eight or more land thing. So maybe you got something going. Now, assuming that we play this in our three spot and this in our four spot already, now we're set up for some elemental generation. Now we need some elementals and we need these to live. A 1-1 one, one and a 3-3, three, three, or though possibly a 4-4 four, four if uh, we played these in order, are probably... Mm, the bodies uh, are not exactly durable. What I'm worried about is that this is more of a limited uh, kind of thing for draft and sealed, because I don't expect these to live very long in standard. I expect if this is your curve, that it's a bit weaker than what everybody else is doing, unfortunately. Now, there are some cards in the set that I will be covering later that create elementals, and if you get this, and then this, and then make elementals, you are doing it. You are going through your deck even better than an explore package would because you're putting the lands directly onto the battlefield instead of into your hand. And you're generating all these triggers, making things bigger. So it's like uh, if you just put these two together and make a bunch of elementals, you get an explore package on steroids. That's not bad. It's not that good. This is the card I'm honestly the least enthused about, it, although I will definitely play some elemental fun tribal stuff. This isn't something I think is going to make a breakthrough, and I would hold off your wild cards until somebody else, some creative mastermind, got mythic with this and put it on Twitter or something. That I'm going to wait for something like that before I craft these, to be totally real with all of you. I might try it. I'm sure some other people will try it as well at the release event, but I'm not nearly as optimistic about this card as I am about the other cards we've looked at so far. Our next card is Yarok the Desecrated. He's been desecrated, you guys. Two in a black and a green and a blue for a desecrated legendary creature, elemental horror. I don't know why I want to keep saying it, but I do. Uh, Mythic Rare, 3-5 body. So thick booty on the desecrated one. Death Touch Lifelink. Nice little combination of stats there, or abilities. If a permanent entering the battlefield causes a triggered ability of a permanent you control to trigger, that ability triggers an additional time. Well, so we've got some funky text right away. A permanent entering the battlefield causes a triggered ability of a permanent you control to trigger. It's 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 like how many times do we say trigger in this sentence? I think we I, I'm triggered by the triplicate of triggers. So what do we want to do with this card? What abilities do we want to trigger multiple times, particularly in Sultai colors? Hey guys, can you imagine that if you have a Yarok the Desecrated and you have a Wild Growth Walker and you have a Jade Light Ranger, you get to gain a whole bunch of life and put all the counters and shut up CGB boring, explore package lame and old and we've seen it enough. 
Okay, okay, but you you get what I'm saying, right? But we'll move on. We'll move on. Don't don't hate me. Don't don't hate me. Don't hate me. We'll move on. Okay, fine. You want crazier? I'll give you crazy. Got eternal Ronus. Double all the power and then double it again. Boom. And plus this one has death touch and lifelink, so that's a lot of life. Niv Mesut Reborn. Grab your top 10, pick some cards, and then do it again, because once just wasn't enough. Boom. I, okay, and it, yeah, you, you get the idea. There's probably even some, like, excellent combos I'm not even thinking of yet. A card like this just reeks of possibilities, plus the body isn't bad, it's resilient. It can come down and really stabilize a battlefield that was built around attacking with small and medium creatures. And something without five power doesn't ever want to attack into it because of the death touch in addition to the lifelink. So it's pretty good on its own. And then when you stack things up on top of it, it becomes very strong. I do think the natural home is the Saltai uh, Dreadhorde deck. Having one of these in your Dreadhorde deck just kind of ensures that you're going to gain enough life with your Wild Growth Walkers and Jade Light Rangers when you bring this back along with them that you get to do all kinds of crazy. And I think at least it can be tried out as a one of in the deck to see how it fits. It might turn out to be win more. It's an exciting card. I like it. I'm a fan. We're going to play it. And I'm looking forward to trying out Yarok the Desecrated. Then, for reasons unknown, Wizards gave us Rainy, 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 um, the Angel of Rebirth. Two red, green, white, legendary creature, Angel. This is a flying, other multicolored creatures you control get plus one, plus O. Oh. Whenever another multicolored creature you control dies, return it to its owner's hand at the beginning of the next end step. It is a 5 4. So, decent body, Naya colors. Other multi-creatures gain plus one, plus oh, okay. And then the last ability, which is the part you, I think, absolutely have to exploit to make this card do work. So, uh, the thing that you want to do with this card is you want to be in a, you don't want to be in a control matchup. I don't think it matters. If you're, if you're in an aggro matchup, if your mid-range, like, Naya deck is, Naya creature deck with multicolored creatures is up against aggro, I don't think it matters what your five mana big bodied thing is they're all good against aggro so if you're playing this against aggro you're already doing well if you're playing this against control you're probably not doing very well the enters the battlefield requires other creatures to be on the board and attacking it's hard to get someone with a plus one plus oh bonus out of your five drop so this is very likely just another dead body against control in a mid-range mirror without counter magic or instant speed interaction <laughs> You, the opponent is playing their things keeping up on the board. You're playing your things keeping up on the board. You have them at a life total where they can't just take a massive beating when you swing. And then you play this card. You buff your creatures a little. You swing with all your creatures. They're forced to make bad blocks and trade. And if they trade, your creatures come back to your hand and you still have an Angel of Rebirth. That is the situation where the card is good. How common of a situation is that for standard? Probably not that often. Um, I'm thinking mostly about in the last like format, probably Gruel Mirrors is where this comes up the most. So, and is it worth having white in your deck and playing a card like this for those situations? Probably not. Probably not even in the sideboard. There's much better ways to break the mirror wide open. Comparing this card to Lyra Dawnbringer or Tulsimir Friend of Wolves or Tristani Discordant, all of those I think are just better cards um in for the most case now you might say this is good protection against kai's wrath well kai's wrath is four mana this is five so it sits at the wrong spot in the curve to defend you in a curve out type game in a game where you're able to drop this and your opponent top pretty much draws or holds exactly kai's wrath and doesn't find any other way to interact with your angel yeah you got him but I don't think that's going to be that good. Okay, I thought of one other place where this is freaking sweet. Let's say you play a Mana Dork. Let's say you play a Vivian, the three mana one. Let's say you played a Vivian and all your creatures have flash. And let's say two turns later, you flash this in in response to the Wrath. Okay, 
well, what happened? This goes to the graveyard and stays in the graveyard. The other creatures go to the graveyard. They come back to your hand, and you spent all your mana on the Angel of Rebirth. Now you can start casting your creatures again, but you did lose your board. Your opponent's not under as much pressure as they were. I still don't call that winning. So, yeah, I'm not excited about this card, which is too bad. I don't know why they decided to drop a Naya Angel. It's always cool if they want to bring more angels to the party. Lyra welcomes all her friends. This just isn't it. This this card is not quite for me. I won't be running out to craft this one. It is a buy a box. You can see down there it's the buy a box promo for the set. And it's no nexus of fate. Let's let's be absolutely clear about that. Okay, there you have it. These are the tricolor cards for Core Set 2020 coming out very soon. At the time you're watching this video, I'll be playing in the release event on July 1st. And then I believe July 3rd or 4th, one of those is going to be the release to Magic Arena. So there'll be an ex a preview event for streamers. I'll be putting some content on YouTube, of course, for that time. And then you will be able to play with the set very soon. Get hyped! A lot of people love the tricolor cards, uh, just kind of being in your shard and getting that flavor. And right now the mana in standard is really good, so you can play tricolor mana bases pretty easily. Sometimes even more colors, four and five color decks aren't unplayable by any means. So people get excited about these cards, and often for good reason. I'm gonna say straight up that I think that the Kaikar Winds Fury is an interesting combo card that likely won't be very powerful because three toughness is too easy to kill. Similar to Omnath Locus of Royal, while the while Omnath is an important part of the elemental strategy and a hope for elemental tribal, I don't think that this will translate well to standard without a lot more help for the elemental tribe. I think that Rini, the bio box promo, isn't worth crafting in Magic Arena, and I wouldn't craft it unless you really have not much else to do with your Mythic Wild cards. I think the card is narrow, and despite some neat abilities and a nice ball of stats, isn't what you're looking for. Yarok the Desecrated is a really neat card that is probably going to help out in some Soul Tide Dreadhorde command decks, but does have a lot of possibilities going for it. And Double Triggers is a very fun ability to have on a decent body that is resilient. Five Toughness lives through Lava Coil, lives through Lightning Strike. The life gain is good against red, so I have hope that this card will show up in a few spots. Kethis the Hidden Hand, I love the idea of this in some kind of an Abzan Elf Nissa type strategy with lots of other legendary cards to get some value from the graveyard. And I wouldn't be surprised if we give Urza's Ruinous Blast one more try with this card, as four mana is a big difference from five. And Kalia the Zenith Seeker, if we don't spend some time trying to make an Angel Demon Dragon deck work, and this card being a four of in it, I will regret my choices. So uh, without question, this is the one I am most excited about. I want to try out that deck. It will probably turn out to be a mid-range kind of pile. The actual strongest card here, I think the one with the most potential for abuse in ways that I probably am not quite grasping yet without playing it, is Kethis the Hidden Hand. The one that I think is most likely to show up quickly is Yarok, and the best build around is Kalia the Zenith Seeker. Thank you for watching this video. In the future, we're going to be doing a video on the Planeswalkers from Corset 2020, and a video on the best sideboard cards from Corset 2020, a video about the lands of Corset 2020, and we're going to cover a variety pack of other spells that I think will impact the format. Let me try that outro one more time. Thank you for watching this video. As always, I will see you in the next video. Goodbye.